Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to our virtual presentation of Hawking Hawking, the selling of a scientific celebrity with author Charles Seif. Uh, this event includes an audience Q&A. To submit a question, please use the Ask a Question button at the very bottom of the screen. Uh, you could also vote for any questions you'd like, and they'll make their way to the very top of the list. Also, please consider supporting Roman's Bookstore by purchasing a copy of Hawking Hawking. Uh, just click on the green purchase button directly below the viewer's screen and it'll take you to our website where you can complete your purchase. Uh, Romans is 127 years old, going on 128 very soon. So and every bit of support goes a very long way. Okay, so let me introduce our speaker and then we can jump right in. So Charles Seif is a professor of journalism at NYU's Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute and has been writing about science and mathematics for nearly three decades. He is the author of numerous books, including the best-selling Zero, the Bio Bi Zero, the Biography of a Dangerous Idea. And with that said, I'm gonna turn off my camera and mic. Enjoy the talk, everyone. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction and hello, everyone. Uh, I wish I were in the room with all of you, but I, I guess uh, infectious disease rules prevent that. Um, and I apologize in advance for the blinding glare for my glasses. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I can't see a thing without them. So uh, I'm Charles Seif. Uh, I'm a journalist and, uh, who specializes in science and I've covered physics uh, particularly for many years. And uh, for the past few years, I've been working on uh, a biography of Stephen Hawking. Now, uh, I'm going to share a, uh, some graphics that I have um, and of course, it begins with the cover. Um, so this is what people think of uh, when uh, they, someone mentions Hawk, uh, Stephen Hawking. Uh, they think of him as the world's best scientist, the leading physicist on the planet uh, who worked on a theory of everything and who unfortunately, uh, due to a deadly disease, was in a wheelchair for much of his life and had to talk uh, with a machine voice, a robotic voice. Um, he was also the author of the most famous work of popular science uh, in a long, long time. Um, and uh, as The Simpsons put it, uh, people think of him as the world's smartest man. That's the image, anyhow. Reality is actually quite a bit more complicated. Hawking was, in fact, a top flight physicist. That's undisputed. Uh, but he himself rejected any comparisons to Newton or Einstein uh, or Galileo. Uh, he was not trying to portray himself, or uh, he, he rejected the comparison between him and those people as uh, their intellectual successor. Um, and there were many, many uh, contemporary physicists of equal and even greater um, importance and insight uh, in the, even in the areas that he was working in. Uh, he didn't actually work on a theory of everything. Um, and uh, he actually worked in black holes and general relativity and cosmology, looking at the beginning and end of the universe. Um, and his important work was done uh, mostly before he became famous. Uh, and though he did, in fact, write one of the best-selling science books uh, of the 20th century, uh, he himself had extreme difficulty communicating, almost more so than anyone else on the planet. There was a lot of irony in Stephen Hawking's life, uh, irony that he himself appreciated. Uh, but to see all that irony, we have to strip away the celebrity, the image he created, and get to the person behind that image. So I'll take you back in time a bit to peel away the myth uh, and image and to get you to the real person underneath. Uh, beginning at the end, the last third of Stephen Hawking's life was dominated by his celebrity. 
uh, by the image he himself had so carefully crafted. Hawking was just one of three scientists to be buried in uh, Westminster Abbey in the past hundred years. This is his grave marker. It's an image of a black hole with uh, the equation related to his most famous scientific discovery. Uh, the fact that black holes actually radiate uh, light and other particles, a phenomenon now known as Hawking radiation. One of the big ironies of Hawking's life is that even though he constantly poo-pooed any comparison between him and Newton uh, and Einstein and Galileo, at the same time, he actively cultivated these comparisons. Take the epitaph of his gravestone. Here lies what was mortal of Stephen Hawking. It is a conscious emulation of the epitaph of Sir Isaac Newton, whose grave is actually just a few feet away in Westminster Abbey. In Latin, here lies what was mortal of Isaac Newton. Indeed, the comparisons to Newton and to Einstein, uh, the idea that he was their intellectual successor was central to his public image. Here is uh, a scene while he was uh, filming uh, scenes for Star Trek. Um, uh, he was actually playing poker with, uh, guess, Einstein and Sir Isaac Newton on the holodeck. Um, Hawking, Hawking's fame rested on this comparison with Einstein and Newton. And Hawking needed his fame more than most celebrities needed theirs. Um, the he needed round-the-clock care because of his disease, which was incredibly expensive. Uh, despite all the royalties he was making on his book and on the films he lent his names to and other merchandise, um, he was always looking for more opportunities to make money because he never really felt secure. The exploitation of the Hawking name is an important leitmotif in the last Third of Hawking's life. For example, he wound up doing an ad campaign for a rather shady bookmaker in England. Uh, he also cultivated and was cultivated by um, millionaires, multimillionaires, and billionaires uh, who wanted Hawking to lend them credibility or lend his name to their endeavors. Uh, George Mitchell, the guy who invented fracking, uh, had a close relationship uh, with Hawking, as did Yuri Milner, a Russian oligarch. Peter Diamandis, a satellite mogul who was trying to get a contract with NASA for doing uh, zero gravity airplane flights. And if you fly an airplane in the right trajectory over the top of the parabola as it begins to dive, you get a short period of time where you float in zero gravity. Um, so Diamandis, uh, before, while bidding for this contract, took Stephen Hawking up uh, into space, uh, and it was really good PR. Um, Richard Branson, the billionaire behind the Virgin Enterprises, um, promised that Hawking would get a free trip into space on his new endeavor um, Virgin Galactic. But it turned out that in 2014, uh, uh, Virgin, Galact uh, Virgin Galactic hit a snag uh, when one of their um, test craft failed in flight and killed a pilot and threw everything into disarray. Um, Branson, uh, dealing with his PR nightmare, when he was trying to relaunch Virgin Galactic, um, decided to call Hawking uh, to tell people not to be afraid of the risks. And he let Hawking name the spacecraft and inscribed an image of Hawking's iris, the iris of his eye, on the fuselage. And yes, Jeffrey uh, uh, Hawking was spotted on Jeffrey Epstein's private island. Um, I have no evidence 
that there was any real significant interaction between Hawking and Epstein. Uh, I mean, it's it, beyond the fact that I think he was uh, uh, visited this island, as did many other physicists during a conference. Um, however, Hawking did acquire a reputation uh, for uh, going to strip clubs and even um, sex clubs. And this was an interesting part of his life, and I'm not going to go into it in a great deal here. I actually don't do a huge amount in the book either, but although it's, it's mentioned. Beyond the fact that I, I think he was acculturated to this during a sabbatical year in Caltech in 1974. Uh, and uh, as Caltech fans know, uh, St uh, when Stephen Hawking was there, so was Nobel laureate uh, Richard Feynman, uh, who also had a reputation for uh, going to strip clubs and even appeared in a lawsuit as an expert witness uh, on uh, strip clubs. Um, another thing that doesn't often, I mean, is unlikely to wind up in an official biography uh, is the degree of control that some people claim uh, were exerted over him by his second wife, Elaine. There are allegations that she abused him both physically and verbally. Uh, remember, Hawking was almost completely paralyzed. Uh, and later in his life, he was barely even able or unable in the last part of his life to control his own wheelchair, his electric wheelchair. Uh, but at the time, he did have some control over it. And one story that I got was that Elaine would punish Stephen uh, by taking the controller to his computer out of his hand, uh, leaving him completely helpless, and then walk away. And these are allegations. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Elaine would not speak to me when I tried to interview her. Um, there were also allegations against one of his nurses, allegations that were unusually kept secret. In my view, there's a lot more to these allegations than meet the eye, uh, at least in this particular case. And his relationships, often uh, with men, women, exacerbated his money woes. These money woes were part of the reason that Hawking would lend his name to a number of endeavors that one would have thought were beneath him, uh, including the advertising for Pat, uh, Patty Power. Truth be told, so long as he made him money, generally speaking, uh, if it didn't humiliate him or uh, make him look terribly bad, he would, he would lend his voice to people. And he would do it quite literally. Um, I interviewed director Errol Morris, who did the Brief History of Time talk, uh, the, the Brief History of Time movie, um, and here's what he said, and uh, I will turn up the volume on my speaker so you can all hear it. Because we had the voice synthesizer and... Theoretically, I could have talking, saying anything. You just type in a sentence and the voice synthesizer speaks the sentence and you record it and you put it in the movie. Uh, and I changed something. It's from one of his public lectures. And he noticed it immediately. He said, you changed that. And then he said, but I like it better. By the end of his life, Stephen Hawking was starring in a TV series or um, uh, an, another every couple of years. Um, he wouldn't really have to do anything beyond sit in his chair. And the director and producer and cinematographers would take a couple of shots of him, usually a long spiral shot of him sitting in his wheelchair, a close up of him, um, of his eye often, and maybe his fingers, um, maybe his computer screen in action. 
And the director would superimpose whatever voiceover that he or she wanted uh, coming directly out of Hawking's uh, voice box, which was lent for the purpose. That Hawking didn't even necessarily have to compose what was said or even ever encounter it. Um, for one show uh, that I analyzed, an entire season of six one-hour shows had a grand total of four minutes of unique Stephen Hawking footage um, mixed and remixed and remixed over and over again to make it look like the physicist was speaking the words that he actually was not. Hawking would also lend his name to some poorly written books. For example, this one, um, which one uh, was uh, patch written, um, in which kind of someone writes directly from uh, a source, or even arguably outright, outright plagiarized. And what's almost certain is that he himself was not doing this because um, for a man who could type a few words a minute, this was not the most efficient way of communicating. Uh, he couldn't turn pages. He couldn't um, do such things on his own. So this is done likely in his name. Um, so that's Hawking in the last third of his life. What about Hawking in the middle when he rose rapidly to fame? His rise to fame in some ways leads to the second great irony of Hawking's life. He really did not want to be treated any differently because of his ALS. But his rise to fame and his later fortune depended to a large extent on the fact that the ALS made him different, and he knew it. Here's a quick timeline of what happened during this midlife period. In 1974, he was elected uh, to the Royal Society, uh, which is he was admitted to the uh, roles of the great British scientists. Uh, he got the Lucasian professorship in 79. And this is the professorship that Sir Isaac Newton held before him. So almost externally being dubbed as the intellectual successor to Isaac Newton. And uh, it is a post of high, high prestige. Um, he was began writing the book that catapulted him to fame in the early 80s. But by 1985, he got very sick and would have to have a tracheostomy. And uh, the tracheostomy caused him to lose his voice, and he got his uh, robotic voice soon afterwards. Um, Brief History of Time, actually, they finished it and published it in 1988, and it was a runaway smash hit, uh, really something that catapulted him into the stratosphere. Hawking himself believed that his meteoric, meteoric rise was due to a large extent to his ALS. As he said regarding the Lucasian Fellowship, I think I was appointed as a stopgap to fill the chair as someone whose work would not disgrace the standards expected of a Lucasian chair. But I think they thought I wouldn't live very long and that they couldn't choose again by which time he, they could find a more suitable candidate. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint the electors. I think that's really tragic because, again, this is a really high-powered physicist who did great things and was rewarded for it. And he always questioned in the back of his mind whether he was being rewarded for his intellect or his difference in his disease. And I find that one of central tragedies. Um, even his election to the Royal Society at the age of 32 was in fact in part due to his disease. I uncovered evidence that he was a close friend and someone who became something of a mentor, uh, Sir Roger Penrose, who actually just won the Nobel Prize, uh, who made it clear that Hawking got through the Royal Society nomination and election process so quickly because Hawking's life expectancy was so short. 
However, scientific plaudits, in fact, were not what made Hawking so famous. It was his book, oh, yeah, that's the Royal Society. Um, it was his book that got him fame. But it's hard to see what's actually his writing and what's the writing of his students and what was inserted by an editor or multiple editors. Here's a first draft um, of his uh, book, uh, Brief History of Time. Uh, from the start of the civilization, man has asked questions such as, when did the universe begin? What happened before the beginning? Will it have an end? Is space finite or infinite? What is the nature of time? What is the difference between the future and the past? The aim of this book is to explain some of the answers to these long-standing questions that are suggested by modern developments in physics and cosmology. For the most part, those answers are fairly generally accepted, but I shall try to make this it clear when they are controversial or when they reflect my personal views, but are not generally agreed. So that really isn't the opening paragraph of a bestseller. Uh, it was frankly not terribly well written, not terribly engaging. However, in a middle draft by 1986, and we know that uh, some of his graduate students, including uh, a gentleman named Brian Witt, had worked on it for some time. Um, this is what came out. Um, there was a story about a well-known scientist who was giving a public lecture on astronomy. He described how the Earth orbits around the sun and how the sun, in turn, is an orbit around the center of a vast collection of stars called our galaxy. At the end of the lecture, a little old lady at the back got up and said, what you've told us is all wrong. The world is really a flat plate supported on the back of a giant tortoise. The scientist thought he could deal with the old lady quite easily. What is the tortoise standing on, he asked. Oh, no, you don't catch me out like that, said the old lady. The tortoise is standing on the back of another giant tortoise, and before you ask me what that tortoise is standing on, let me tell you that it's standing on the back of another tortoise, and so on. By the final draft, there was some more tweaking. Um, uh, it wound up with the famous uh, turtles all the way down. Um, the final version looks a lot, in fact, like a version that came out of Natural History uh, magazine in 1974 and was republished in Reader's Digest not so long after. I actually think that Hawking uh, got a version of the anecdote um, when he was in Texas at one point. So uh, I do know that he was exposed to this anecdote way earlier. And not that uh, uh, reusing an old anecdote is a bad thing, but it does very much uh, approach uh, stuff that was written by others. Um, authorship aside, there was an immediate question about whether his publishers were exploiting him, uh, exploiting Hawking's disability to sell books. Uh, one uh, writer wrote, I believe it was in New York Magazine, um, that this is an almost unprecedented exploitation of a nonfiction author. I defy Bantam to name another nonfiction book in America, any nonfiction book other than autobiography or biography with a picture of its author on the front cover. Even Carl Sagan, whose books on cosmology and the universe and whose wide TV exposure have made him a widely recognized face, had never had his own photograph on the front of a book. And that was true. Um, I spoke to his editor, and his editor strongly disputes this. Um, but the most telling comment in the interviews I conducted comes from a friend of his at Cambridge, uh, Simon Mitten. Um, who uh, was the director of the, at the time of a, of a uh, Cambridge uh, University Press, a smaller publisher, um, who was also put in a bid for the book. Do be careful if you're dealing with these people, Stephen, a friend uh, Simon Mitten had said. Do ensure that you are certain that if the aim is to make money and to sell lots and lots of books, you don't mind the marketing techniques. What do you mean, Hawking had said? Well, I wouldn't put, uh, push, but, uh, put it past them to market it as, quote, aren't cripples marvelous, unquote. You've got to go into it with your eyes open. If you don't mind that approach, okay. 
According to Mitten, and I tend to agree, Hawking made the deal with Bantam knowingly, uh, having a sense that his disability was going to be a major selling point. It was something of a Faustian bargain. And the fame uh, wound up being something that he absolutely adored. It was worth it to him. But it also did have a cost. And among other things, uh, the fame did was a proximate cause for the loss um, of his family. That, in fact, he shortly there after the publication of a Brief History of Time divorced Jane and had a difficult relationship uh, with his kids for a number of years afterwards. They did eventually reconcile, at least mostly. Uh, you'll notice that in all of this talk, I've been I've been speaking for uh, quite a while without really talking about Hawking science um, and his genius, which there is a genius. And that's because by the middle part of his life, the scientific elements were fading. The last real important stuff was in the early 80s. Uh, this is a timeline of Hawking's big, important contributions. Um, and as I said, the last big, important contribution, at least in, in my view, happened in the early 1980s. So you really have to go to his early life to see his and understand his science. And that leads to the third great irony of Hawking's life. He was celebrated as this lone genius that, like Newton, outshone his colleagues and was trying to like Einstein, create a theory of everything. When in fact, his work was very much collaborative and he never really worked on theory of everything at all. Uh, now, a talk like this isn't the best place to go deep into Hawking science, although I'm happy to field questions on this. Um, but uh, I'm not going to explain them here beyond the fact that some of these were really, really important. Uh, his work on black holes in particular the discovery of Hawking radiation, which set up a major paradox at the interface between general relativity and quantum mechanics was incredibly influential. And uh, his were some of the most interesting and important results in relativistic physics in the past couple of decades. But you'll notice that a theory of everything is not on here because it turns out he was not on the track. He never seriously pursued it. Um, but because of his work on black holes, high gravity and small space, uh, he was working with both quantum theory and general relativity. And that overlap is that clash between these two theories is where people think a theory of everything will emerge from. Um, and uh, the other element, he was not alone almost ever. Uh, he had lots of competition, many of whom worked on the same things, many of whom influenced him and many, many of whom he influenced. Um, and uh, there were others who were con even considered stronger physicists. Here's a letter from one of the leading lights of general relativity um, at the time, John Archibald Wheeler, uh, describing how he felt the field of general, general relativity stood in 1970. In every assessment of any scope, I continue to name as the six most promising people I know, Zeldovich of Moscow, Misner of Maryland, Penrose of London, Carter of Cambridge, Thorne of Caltech, Garak of Texas. Hawking is not among these. I'll notice there are Nobel Prize winner names among those. Hawking had lots of competition and he was not a light that was so different from the best physicists of the day. I mean, he was definitely a physicist of the first rank, but he was not so superlative that he was stood above them like a Newton or an Einstein. Uh, this isn't to diminish Hawking's achievements one bit, uh, but to per put them in perspective. The biography I've written is about a man who's much more complex than his image. The real triumph of Hawking wasn't that he was the world's smartest man, but that he had, uh, he had an he was a really important first rank scientist. 
he discovered something new that changed our understanding of the universe, and he did it multiple times. And that's to be celebrated. And the real tragedy of Hawking is not really his struggle with ALS, physically at least. To me, it's another consequence of his disease. Hawking kept a poster of Marilyn Monroe on the wall. Uh, I think it was from the Seven Year Itch. Uh, he actually had a thing for Marilyn. Um, during a filming of uh, The Brief History of Time, the Marilyn poster slipped from the wall to the floor. Director Errol Morris looked at the image and then turned to Hawking and said, I figured it out why you have all these pictures of Marilyn Monroe on the wall. Like you, she was a person appreciated for her body and not necessarily her mind. Morris said, he gave me this really crazy look like, what the F are you talking about, Mr. Morris? He gave me this crazy look and then finally there's a click and he said, Yes. Thank you. That's the end of the presentation of this talk. And I will take cues. I think I have time for a uh, excerpt or two. Um, please stop me if I am out of time. OK. The first excerpt uh, is, uh, it was a brief history of time that catapulted um, Hawking into celebrity, it transformed him from an extremely well-regarded but relatively obscure physicist into probably the most recognized scientist on the planet, the archetype of a living genius. And um, this excerpt shows how unexpected it was even to him. Not since Einstein had a theoretical physicist been the sort of person who would merit a profile of time and the cover of Newsweek. Nobody in the publishing world had seen lightning like this before. It was getting easier to mistake Hawking for a god, or at least a rock star. In Chicago, two superfans, Susan Anderson and Bill Allen, printed 500 t-shirts bearing the words Stephen Hawking Fan Club, and they immediately sold out. So the pair printed more. Within two months, the number of shirts on the street had skyrocketed to 8,000, and they were appearing all over the city. Anderson and Allen started getting requests for them all over the world, including from a certain physicist in Cambridge who wanted them in medium and large sizes. At the peak of the craze, one Chicago high school senior admitted that his t-shirts confused his classmates. My friend looked at, their shirt, at the shirt and asked, what rock group is this hawking in? He told People Magazine. Worse, I have friends who claim that they have his latest album. At first, Hawking couldn't quite fathom how famous his book had made him or what his fame would mean. According to a graduate student of his, Ray Laflam, the winter after a brief history of time came, first came out, Stephen decided to give a series of eight lectures to undergraduates at Cambridge based on the book, one for each lecture, one lecture for each chapter. On the day of the first lecture, Laflamme picked Hawking up at the house, but Hawking was in a rotten mood. Stephen was very unhappy, and he was grumpy. Everything I was doing was wrong, so I stopped and I said to Stephen, I don't put you the right way in the chair, or it's too late to go to the bathroom, or the tea is too hot or too cold. What is wrong? Laflamme recalls. Peevishly, he looked at me and says, I'm worried about my lectures. I'm worried that no one will show up. Soon it was time to go. The two physicists made their way across campus to the lecture hall. You roll from the back door to the guts of the building, which doesn't have too many stairs. And we arrived in the room, and it was packed. Packed with people. People sitting on the stairs, uh, probably breaking all the rules, rules for safety, says Laflamme. And suddenly, Stephen has this big grin, that smile. That tells you that even he didn't expect to catch that fire. OK. I think uh, we have uh, time for a second excerpt. Again, please stop me if we do not. Uh, yeah, we have time for a second excerpt. OK. This excerpt um, has to do with Hawking's stubbornness. Hawking could be incredibly stubborn. And in this excerpt, this trait is on display. Among other things, his graduate students has to convince him that he's wrong about an assumption he made about how the 
flow of time works in the universe, the so-called arrow of time problem. Stephen Hawking did not admit defeat easily, even when he would play with children. He used to play board games, his son Timothy had told an interviewer. He wasn't the easiest opponent, particularly at chess. Surely he let you win, the interviewer said. Well, no, there was no compassion there at all. He was hugely, hugely competitive. Timothy wasn't the only child who experienced his father's fierce competitive streak. A number of years later, uh, after Laflamme graduated, he visited Hawking with his two children, Patrick and Jocelyn Toe, about eight and six years old. At Elaine's suggestion, they decide to play a board game together called Avalanche. Each player in turn drops marbles uh, into the top of a box full of little ob obstacles that swing back and forth. As the marble falls, uh, it might get stuck on the obstacles, or if dropped in the right place, it might jostle some of them and trigger a cascade of falling marbles. As it's a physical game, Hawking couldn't do it alone. He directed La Flamme where to drop the marble. So there's Stephen Hawking playing against my two kids. Patrick was not very good. He loses very quickly. But Jocelyn was six or seven. She has a good flair for maths and those kinds of puzzles, and she's really competing against Stephen, Laflamme laughs. I had to put a marble in a place, so I was going from one location to another. I'm waiting for Stephen to make a sign, and I don't know, something caught him, and it kind of winks, and I let it go down, and he loses. And Stephen looks really pissed, and then he says, I didn't say yes. As Laflamme knew, Hawking's stubborn refusal to admit defeat extended to his scientific work, too. During Hawking's convalescence, Laflamme kept beavering away at the arrow of time problem, and no matter what he did, the math was leading him in a different direction from what Hawking's intuition would say. The collapse of the universe was not behaving like a time reverse direction of its expansion. The arrow of time would simply not switch direction as the universe begins to recollapse. Upon Hawking's return, Laflamme showed the results to his mentor, who refused to believe him. I was not getting things uh, were going to reverse, and Stephen would kind of challenge me back. He would say, well, you're doing this, but have you thought about this approximation, Laflamme says? Of course, I hadn't thought about it. So I would go back and calculate for a couple of weeks and then come back, and he would, he would say, well, okay, I think this approximation is okay because of this, 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 this. And I still don't have the arrow of time reversed. But then he said, oh, but what about that? And he would send me off for another two weeks. Hawking had an endless litany of objections, each of which could be defeated eventually, but bringing Laflamme no closer to convincing his advisor that the arrow of time assumption was wrong. Luckily, Don Page, a Hawking student for more, than, for more than a decade back, came to town in early 1986 and sat in on one of the Hawking students' weekly Friday meetings. Page had been working on the same problem, but from a slightly different direction, and he was getting the same results as Laflamme. Don, being older and more mature than me, says Stephen will never believe it unless it comes from himself, Laflamme says. So our job is not to go frontward straight to his face, telling him he is wrong. We have to ignore the fact that he's wrong and build the case slowly by moving things together until he will realize the idea is wrong. Page and Laflamme set out to do just that. They presented him with little results that they had proven bit by bit without any reference to the arrow of time problem, each of which Hawking accepted. Yet those, those little results were seemingly unrelated. Once you accepted them, together they excluded the possibility that the arrow of time would reverse. And then suddenly one day Stephen says, but the arrow of time thing, this idea will never work. Then both Don and I said, absolutely. Thank you very much. All right. So we have a little bit of time. Um, so I did want to close the event uh, with one final question uh, to you, Charles, if that's OK. Certainly. All right, so you shared a lot of interesting facts about Hawking in your presentation, and there are other biographies about Hawking. So my question is, what was the most surprising anecdote about Hawking you learned during your research? Uh, uh, well, some of the most interesting anecdotes I'm unable to print <laughs> because <laughs> uh, uh, there's when it comes from one source, and you're unable to verify it. It's kind of you, you really can't uh, print it. Uh, of those that I uh, verified, um, I mean, it's, the stories I was hearing about uh, his second marriage uh, and the difficulty he had, and yet, uh, and in many ways, everyone people 
both loved and hated his second wife, who's a very interesting character. And one of the biggest regrets I have in the book is that she was unwilling to sit down and talk with me uh, because she was a dynamic character who clearly entranced him. And yet a lot of people who knew Hawking very well said that there was something quite amiss going on. Um, well, I, I wish we could have read that in your book as well. It sounds really interesting. Um, it's, it's quite a shame that it couldn't make it in. Um, with that said, uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you, Charles, for your presentation. Um, if you would like to purchase a copy of Hawking Hawking tonight, uh, just click on the green purchase button directly below the viewer's screen. It'll take you to our website where you can complete your purchase. And for those of you who tuned in late, don't worry, a replay of this talk will be available after the broadcast ends, and we'll be uploading it onto our YouTube channel as well in a couple of days. And I think that about covers it. Uh, thank you, everyone, again. Have a good night and stay safe, everyone. All right. Thank you.